If you wish to follow along in your Bibles, you turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. Reading the first 17 verses. Just listen reverently. This is God's Word. Colossians 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. And you have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man. But Christ is all and in all. And so as those who've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. The text this evening is verses 1 and 2. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Seeking the things above. Setting your mind on the things above. What does Paul mean? Well, the word phronos in the Greek means to exercise our mind, to be mentally disposed in a certain direction. It means to interest oneself with something of concern or obedience to it. It means to savor or enjoy something and to set our affection upon it. In sum, it means a conscious, sanctified, directed choice to think on that which is righteous and holy and good, particularly that which is above, or related directly to that which is above. Now, that's a rich, rich term. And tonight I'm going to ask you, if you've not heard it before, to not panic when I say the word epistemology. You will survive. 
Epistemology is the science of knowledge. Or how do we know that what we know is knowable? And you have an epistemology. I remember some years back, I said to a young lady in a discussion, I said, your epistemology is really showing. And she went, eek! That wasn't epidermis, it was epistemology. And every one of you in this room, and everyone who hears this in the electronic means, has an epistemology. And most people are wondrously self-unaware of what their epistemology is. If somebody were to come to you and say, can you describe your epistemology, do you think you'd be ready to answer that question? Because you have one. Every one of us has a way that we process knowledge and information. One of the simplest ways is to just react defensively to something that we don't like or we have a bad feeling about or be pleased if somehow it seems good, which is the lowest level of epistemological self-awareness if it can be dignified with self-awareness. Ultimately, God has an intent that we have a keen sense of how we think. To put it another way, he desires in us a biblical epistemology. And in verse 2, that's well summarized in this phrase, set your mind, it's almost like the idea of setting down a golden bowl, well understood in terms of its value, setting it down on a table and being able to understand its essence and its nature and its use. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Now, I'd like to give you two examples of Christ dealing with the issue of epistemology. Doesn't use that word, but that's clearly what's in view. And the first is a follow-on of a text that I used this morning from John 8. Verse 31, Jesus therefore was saying to those Jews, and note carefully that at the end of the verse, or the end of that phrase says, who had believed him. So he's talking to people who had some kind of conscious acceptance of the person of Jesus Christ. And it says then that he told them, if you abide in my word, that's an epistemological issue, the word of God being a compendium of propositionally stated truths and rebukes and admonitions and encouragements, and Christ in particular, then you are truly disciples of mine. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Those are huge issues of how we think and how we think about our thinking. Notice the response in verse 33 and following. They answered him, we are Abraham's offspring and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. Whoa. Realize what they said? We have never been enslaved to anyone. Had they been delivered from Egypt? Had they been delivered from the, Mid the Midianites? Had they been delivered from the Philistines? Had they been delivered from the Babylonians? Had they been delivered from the Assyrians? And I haven't by any means listed all of the ones that had at one time or another been a ruling, oppressive nation over Israel of old. This is an example of spastic defensiveness. They assume that he's talking about political bondage. And they're so hypersensitive in that that they say this monstrous inaccuracy and so then ask the question how is it that you say you shall become free Christ graciously answers them truly truly I say to you everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin he's talking about bondage to sin not political bondage and they did not grasp that and so he said then I say to you truly, 
Everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin, and the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. If therefore the son shall make you free, you shall be free and true. That's an example of thinking that was reactive, not principle-based, not truth-based, and primarily emotional and defensive. Now in Matthew, there's a remarkable contrast. And the words of our Lord Jesus Christ are well worthy of serious attention. Matthew 8. The account of the centurion who comes to Jesus Christ with a request. Verse 5. And when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, entreating him, and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering great pain. And he, that is Christ, said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. To my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled. Now let's pause a minute. How many instances do you know recorded in Scripture where Jesus marveled with pleasure at what someone did or said? They're not a lot. And here is a Roman warrant officer or senior non-commissioned officer, a Gentile, in an organization not noted for its kindness, the Roman army. They were masters at crucifixion. There are accounts of after conquering nations that sometimes they would set up a row of crosses that went out of sight down a road crucifying people. And so here's this Gentile army officer, which, by the way, I failed to mention, as they said the word in John 8, that they'd never been bondage to anyone. They were seething with anger at being under the bondage of Rome, which is, of course, a marvelous insight into the capacity for self-deception that we have, which is an epistemological issue, end of aside. So what is it that caused Christ to marvel well, consider this. In all probability, the centurion did not have the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, we can't say he didn't, but it's probably likely that he had not been raised with the Old Testament scriptures. And yet he took one abstract principle, the principle of hierarchical authority, and drew from that a compelling conclusion. One of the things we know is that a common in human history, no matter what the nation, the people may be, that when it comes to raising a military organization, generally an army, ancient times, you had to have an authority structure. Somebody has to be the boss. I don't know if you know this or not, but after 1917, when the communists took over Russia, the Soviets, in the attempt to apply the bankrupt doctrines of socialism, and the egalitarian that's egalitarianism that it supposedly uh, exhibits, removed all signs of rank from their officers. So it was supposedly a rankless army. And they had another anomaly that they would put in each unit a political officer who supposedly had the same rank as the commanding officer who didn't have rank. It was a marvelous exercise in befuddlement. And it worked just fine through the 30s until Nazi Germany attacked 1939. My memory is no, 1941. They attacked Russia. And within a matter of a few weeks, the Russian army 
the Soviet army had rediscovered the need of a military hierarchy. There are certain things that you can do that are fantasy, but when it comes to fighting a warfare, there are certain basics that we know. That you have to command men to move into a situation that's counterproductive to their own personal interest, which is counterintuitive, and which we naturally would turn away and flee from instead of walking into the danger that has a high probability of killing us. There has to be a remarkable degree of discipline involved. And I remind you that Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, of course this is prior to his resurrection, made the remarkable statement before the Great Commission, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. That's powerful. And here the centurion recognizes the authority of Jesus Christ, not only in terms of his power, but his standing. He calls him Lord. He recognizes that Jesus Christ, even in his state of humiliation, has the authority and the power to do something that was supernatural. And Jesus basically is saying, this man, figuring out the application of a universal principle, has done more in the way of believing in me than all the Jews with their scriptures. That's epistemology. In the best and highest sense of the word, in which his thinking was not based upon feelings and, first of all, personal experience, although that was part of its ap application, but the recognition of a structure in which there's a hierarchy of those that are subordinates and those that are superiors. And, of course, Jesus Christ is superior to all of us, and we're all subordinates to him, and therein is the connection. And Jesus Christ marveled and said, I have not found such faith with anyone in Israel. So does this thinking of the centurion catch your attention? You get some sense. Wait a minute. There's something here worth thinking about. So in terms of the exhortation in Colossians 3, to set our minds on heavenly things. That translation is, in a sense, we could say generic, because things is not specific. And that's at least the translation that's used in the New American Standard and some others. Set your mind on the things above. So we have to go to the text to get a sense of direction in terms of fulfilling this commandment. And I remind you, it is a command to set our minds on heavenly things. And what's the, again, key to a right use of this? Look carefully at the text. Verse 1. If then you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. There's the key. There's a vast number of things we could think about that are about. It's not uncommon for uh, people to turn aside to ancillary or tertiary issues. The big one is the study of angels. And the whole, there's a whole school of heretical thought and getting your personal angel to be your personal servant and other such heretical thinking. But the fact is that what we're to focus on is Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. He is the ultimate issue, the ultimate reality upon which we're to place our thought life. Now think for a moment about thinking. We have a brain. We know it's the centerpiece of thought. And you can take two people, a pair of identical twins, 
And one can be filled with ungodly worldliness and an identical twin, fellow sister or brother, can be filled with godliness. That this mind that God has given us, we're made in his image, God is a thinking God, is the repository of thought. And thought influences everything we say and everything we do. It influences us subtly and overtly. Every decision that we make is a thought process brought to some kind of conclusion and application. Every decision. So what are we then to do with this? Well, I'd like to take you to a general direction that's very helpful. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. And this afternoon we were chatting about this, and Pam was telling me that in a schoolroom she was in, I'm assuming in Wales, that the teacher had put this text around the periphery of the ceiling, the top of the walls. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good reputation, if there's any excellence and anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. We live in an age where distraction has become a major problem. It's been long recognized in colleges that Americans who have grown up watching TV can have a struggle paying attention in an hour long lecture in a school room, classroom. The average time, I understand, I've not bothered to check it out myself, but the average time between commercials, the maximum time is seven minutes, 7.5 minutes. And this morning I was intrigued in the very blessed time of prayer before the service, that a number of you asked for freedom from distraction. Isn't that interesting? And I find that in the congregation in Hanford and other places I've been, that this is often mentioned as a plea because we're conditioned to be distracted. Are we not? Consider this, you drive along the highway and they don't just have ordinary billboards, they now have electronic billboards. So that if you're watching it, you have sufficient distance, you can get two or three usually obnoxious or insipid messages. But distraction is the name of the game, to distract you in one way or another. Now we know that there are more deaths from people using cell phones and iPods and whatever other electronic devices they walk across roads or drive than there are from drunk drivers. That point was, I understand, crossed last year. That screams distraction. And so really this is a call to focus our thinking. Would you turn please to Colossians 3 again? Set your mind. I gave you some of the de definitions or the explanation of that word. And now the question is, is this a one place exhortation or is it supported by other scriptures? Would you turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5? May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Now, our hearts don't mean the organ in our chest that goes pump, 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 and circulates our blood. That's referring to the will, that part of our thinking that's the volitional or decisional part of our thinking. And here the prayer of Paul is, that God may direct our thoughts into the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. That's a wonderfully clear focus on what to think about, is it not? 
the steadfastness of Christ, the faithfulness of Christ, the unchanging perfection of Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the love of God the Son. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, gird your minds for action. Wait a minute. The phrase to gird yourself usually applies to strapping on a sword for combat. That's the normal use of that phrase. And here Paul is saying under the, or excuse me, Peter is saying under the inspiration of the Spirit, gird your minds for action. So not just a theoretical, philosophical exercise of meandering through some kind of abstract musings, but a very distinct focus of so disciplining our minds that the action that flows out of that thinking is godly. Keep sober in spirit, fix your hope in other words, lock your hope, or glue your hope, if you will, completely to the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I hope something's beginning to emerge here. It's all about Christ, we could say. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't praise God, worship the Father, but remember, we have no access to or relationship with the Father apart from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of the gospel. And we're to fix our minds on him who is at the right hand of the throne of grace. Chapter 2 of 1 Peter, verse 4. And coming to him as to a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What's the spiritual sacrifice that Paul speaks of in Romans 12? Worship. Think about worship epistemologically. We do something that the world considers insane, do we not? We come into a building, we sit in rows, and we listen to somebody dissect or exposit or explain, what word you want to use, a book from a book that's 2,000 years old. Insanity to the world. And yet we know that that business, that calling, that process and activity of listening to the word of God is designed by God as a means of grace. Verse 14 of Romans 10. How shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they've been sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. However, they did not all believe the glad tidings. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So... Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. That's an epistemological issue. Consider for a moment again, does scripture reward faith based visually or auditorially? What did Christ say to Thomas? Do you believe because you've seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. So when you hear the word of God, you're processing language. And you process it well or poorly. Every one of us does. With every sentence we hear, every word that's spoken to us, we're in the process of processing that. And then finally, Titus chapter 3, if you will. Titus 3, beginning with verse 4. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration 
and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want to speak confidently. I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good deeds. Now, that's a remarkable summary of the gospel in a very succinct way. But think of all these issues. Washing of regeneration, renewing by the Holy Spirit, poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, being justified by grace, that we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Those are abstract ideas. Those are concepts that we have to wrap our mind around. And they have an effect upon us. In the great high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ, John 17, 17, he had the most insightful and remarkable petition, sanctify them through the truth. Your word is truth. The power to change us in spite of us comes through the word of God in its truth-bearing nature. And if you think about it, even the issue of what is truth is not something we automatically answer. Remember Pilate's response to Christ? He said, what is truth? And if you try to define it, besides saying the word of God, it gets a little tricky. There is small t truth, reporting something honestly, but big, big T or capital T truth really is the word of God. And the word of God is a collection of accounts, of events and principles and concepts that come from the mind of God himself. So that when you and I are thinking about the Word of God, we're actually imitating the thoughts of God. Now, if you and I would be faithful in being good thinkers, we have to face the fact of what is our natural estate, mentally, cognitively, thoughtfully, Isaiah 55. Verse 8, I trust many of you know this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. There's an infinite gap between the way God thinks and the way we think. And yet Jesus Christ is the one who bridges that gap not just redemptively, but conceptually. Not just redemptively, but in a ministering fashion whereby we're moved bit by bit from thinking like men, thinking like the world, to imitating the thoughts of God. Is that real? I submit it is. What does Paul say to the Thessalonians about that process? First Thessalonians. Chapter 1. Verse 3. Verse 2, excuse me. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind, there's an issue of thinking, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know, there's the, again a mental activity, knowing something, being able to grasp it, understand its significance, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for, our, for your sake, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. 
you became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation. Today, we live in a society where people believe they own themselves. Christ tells us that if we're believers, we're bought with the price. And if you and I really believe that we are Christ's property twice over, once by creation and once by redemption, beloved, your mind belongs to Jesus Christ. What you do with it is powerful. Every single day, for good or for ill, what you do with your mind is a professing Christian. How do you use it? I believe one of the earliest epistemological texts that is very practical in application, one of the great ones, is Proverbs chapter 3. And this is again one I suspect many of you know. But let's see if by God's grace we could briefly take that apart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Is that a thought issue? Is that an issue of thinking? It is, isn't it? Do not lean on your own understanding. Now that's heavy. Do not lean on your own understanding. That's the first of two negative commandments. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Do I really believe that I am commanded not only not to lean on my own understanding, but not to be wise in my own eyes? If I put feet to that commandment, to not be wise in my own eyes, it means I must admit what I am since I'm not wise. And the answer is foolish. In and of myself, I'm properly to understand that my mind is the playground of evil apart from the grace of Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking just about lusts and so on. I'm talking about all manner of evil and, of course, one of the greatest being idolatry of self. So that means if I'm going to be blessed in my decision-making, it has to start with a conscious awareness that I am not capable in my own strength to think properly. I have to start with the recognition that I represent a puddle of peril. I represent a stumbling block to myself if I am thinking apart from the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. And then do not lean on your own understanding. Let me ask you a question. Do you have any decisions you've ever regretted? Any decisions you wish you could do over? I suspect if you're more than five or six years old, you can begin to think of decisions you wish you had not made. And every one of those decisions, I suspect, came from leaning on your own understanding and not leaning on the understanding of God. Yes? So here, the scripture, in telling us to set our minds on things that are above, the scriptures are giving us a recipe for blessing, profound blessing. Now, we mentioned this morning in a different context, 1 John 4. I want to read that again because it's so powerful. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not made perfect is not made perfect in love. Now let me ask you a question. Have you reached a place in your walk with Christ that you are delivered from the temptation to be fearful? 
can you say you've reached the place that you're fearless? I suspect probably not. Overcoming fear, which is unbelief, is as common to man as breathing and sleeping and all those things we take for granted. Fear is basically a state of mind, is it not? Fear is a decision, often arrived at in a millisecond, but still a decision, to doubt the faithfulness of God in terms of a real or imagined peril. And here, the possession of fear is linked to a failure to see and believe mental issues, the love of God in Jesus Christ. He that fears is not made perfect in love. That's, of course, the love of Christ, not a, our own love for him or for one another. So what then should you and I think about this? Is, does it matter? Is it important? Should we get serious about our thought life as an arena in which we submit to the Lord and call upon him to be the Lord of our thoughts? And I would say, if this has meant anything to you, absolutely. Now, I want to take you to a few other texts that bear on this, setting our minds on that which is above. Would you turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? 2 Thessalonians 2 is, I believe, one of the most sobering parts of the New Testament. In 2 Thessalonians 2, there's a remarkable, long, Pauline paragraph talking about the man of sin. So I'm going to pick up in the middle of Paul's discourse, verse 6. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. And there's a whole bunch of uh, issues here that we could get sidetracked on. But verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This is not surprising if you look at the way the United States has declined spiritually in the last 40 or 50 years. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Beloved, is being deceived a thinking issue? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.33, don't be deceived. Evil communications corrupt good morals. Have there been many young people who have brought upon themselves tragedy by choosing to associate with companions who were evil? Do we know that as a temptation of every generation? I think you know the answer. So continuing, with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because, look at the second half of this word, of this verse, cause and effect, they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Tonight, if you love the truth of God, you are the recipients of a sovereign grace that you love his truth to the place that God has used it instrumentally to change you from an enemy, an adversary, a reprobate, to a beloved son or daughter of the Most High God. Now that isn't all. Look at verse 11. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false. A deluding influence. Do you believe it's a privilege to be protected?
from the judicial spirit of deception that God sends on those who hate his word. I think this is exceedingly and soberingly serious. Verse 12, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. So what do you have, if I could put it this way, in the way of thought life rattling around in your head? We all have thoughts circulating continually through our minds, even when we're asleep. We know our mind is not fully shut off. It doesn't turn out like a nightlight does. And it's the switch is flipped. This should be an area that we're jealous, jealous, jealous to protect. And I want to take you now to the final place of encouragement in this matter. Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, referring to that list of witnesses in chapter 11, so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now I propose to you this morning that we have an easy yoke. There are obligations that are laid down by Jesus Christ for us to seriously embrace and apply. And certainly this is one, to lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Well, we know that laying aside the sin that so easily entangles us is not so easily done. In fact, it's tough. I believe of the world, the flesh, and the devil, the flesh is the worst, our own sinful heart. And so what's the answer to not only laying it aside, but running with endurance or perseverance the race set before us? Two, here comes the answer, and it's glorious. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. I love it, friends. I love it. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. We have a dog. The dog trains us well. We have discovered that the dogs know how to train their people. And our dog can train us by looking, crossing her paws and looking so reproachful that eventually you can't stand it. You make some kind of concession. Pathetic. That's a tiny picture of what should be a norm for us of being able to focus so intently on just one thing that you don't let go of it until you receive the blessing. Isn't it a shame that a dog can sometimes show more persistence in fixing its attention on something than we can as believers? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. And then, of course, the focus of that fixing, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And remember, we started with looking at to him who is seated at the right hand of the throne of grace. Paul is here saying, or if it's not Paul, the author of Hebrews, that the answer is to focus upon Jesus Christ and particularly when he fixed his face like, set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem to offer up himself in that was the ultimate fixing his attention on something absolutely and infinitely important. And then to help us get it better, please God, the author continues in verse 3, for consider him, you can translate that, focus upon him, ponder him, who has such, endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Is growing weary and losing heart an issue of your thought life? Is it? It is, isn't it? 
So beloved, I hope that's an encouragement. We've just scratched the surface. There's many other texts that I'd like to set before you on this subject. But I hope this gets you thinking about the fact you have an arena of responsibility, and that is your thought life and how you manage it. And if you manage it focused upon Jesus Christ, on his terms, in the light of scripture, you will do well.